Hello and welcome to College Physics 1, Lecture 6, Representing Position and Velocity. In the next several lectures, we'll focus on how to describe motion using several different relationships, including motion diagrams, graphs, and mathematical equations. We will defer a treatment of why objects move, um, as they do, until we get beyond all of this and start talking about forces. The branch of physics that deals with the description of motion is called kinematics. This comes from the Greek root word kinema, meaning movement. You know this word through its English variation, cinema. In other words, motion pictures. So, with this in mind, let's start representing our uh, position. So, to begin, we're going to go with just a really basic uh, definition of uh, how to use our coordinate axes. So, when we use an x-axis, um, typically we will see that used for horizontal motion, but it can also be used for motion along a ramp, which is something we will see in another few lectures from now. A y-axis is used for vertical motion. So perhaps, uh, say, an object or animal that jumps upward or somebody dropping an object off a building, vertical motion would be used with the y-axis. The positive end of an x-axis is to the right. In other words, the negative end is to the left. And the positive end of a y-axis is upward, while as the negative end is downward. So just an important uh, set of rules to establish before we jump into these uh, examples. So right off the bat, let's start with an example. This is an example that we're going to use throughout the entirety of this lecture. So consider the situation of a student walking to school. She is moving horizontally, so we will use the variable x to describe her motion. We have set the origin of the coordinate system to be x equals 0 at her starting point, and we measure her position in meters. We have included velocity vectors connecting the successive positions on this motion diagram. So this motion diagram shows that she leaves, uh, let's say from home, at a time that we choose to call time t equals 0. So as soon as she starts moving, time starts as well. And then makes steady progress for some time. But beginning at about 3 minutes, there is a period in which the distance traveled during each time interval becomes shorter. Perhaps she slowed down to speak with a friend. Then, at 6 minutes, the distance traveled within each interval is longer, perhaps because she realizes she's running late, and so she begins to jog toward class. So what we were just talking about is just a distinction. So in the beginning, it seems like she's walking up at a pretty steady pace. But once you get here, notice the dots are closer together, indicating she traveled less distance in the same amount of time as earlier. So she must have slowed down in the middle of this phase. But then notice the distance greatly increases afterward, so maybe she again is running late and decides to jog to class. So this is the setup for an example that we're going to use throughout much of this lecture um, today. Well, this is just one way to represent the motion of the student using this motion diagram. Well, we could also present it as a table. So instead of putting all those dots onto a nice motion diagram, just list them off in a table and you have nice numbers to go with it. So um, at time t equals zero, when she first started, she was at her origin, so position equals zero. But after a minute of walking at a steady pace, she ended up at 60 meters, then after two minutes at 120, and so on and so forth. Now, most people, uh, from my experience, are visual learners, and so this table of numbers isn't as helpful as the motion diagram that we had, which is why we tend to make visual examples, not just a bunch of tables with numbers. That said, there is a third way to represent that motion. And this is the one that is the primary focus of not only this lecture, but probably the next one or two after it. 
And this is where we come into our discussion of graphs. A third way to represent the motion is to use the data from the table to make a graph of the positions of the student at each minute of time. Such a graph that shows an object's position over time is appropriately called a position versus time graph. So position versus time, so position, the y value, versus time, the horizontal value. And so all this is is the motion diagram or the numbers from the table laid out into a nice graph. So again, at uh, time t equals zero, when she first started, she was at the origin. So we put a dot there. After one minute, she was at 60 meters. After two minutes, she was at 120 meters. After three minutes, she was at 180. After four minutes, then to 200. So, I mean, I don't need to say that for all of them, you get the idea. So we have constructed a position versus time graph now another way to represent this motion. Now, it does take time to, uh, you know, draw your axes, um, look at each data point and figure out exactly where to put it on your graph and then to do that, you know, 10 times. But this gives us more information than either the table or the motion diagram that we started with uh, gives. And so our purpose here is to reveal some of the information that is hidden in these graphs. So, let's go ahead and first, uh, actually before I move forward, let me just make an important note. This is not a picture of this student's motion. In other words, the student isn't moving like up and to the right, then slightly more to the right, and then slightly more up. This is a person walking straight down a path along a straight line. Um, so the student is walking along a straight line, but the graph itself is not straight. And so this can be a confusing relation for students to um, deal with when they're first beginning these discussions of graphs. So again, this is motion along a straight line. All it's doing is showing the position increasing as she moves away from her origin point. Okay, so before we actually jump into the details of what this graph shows us, let's just try to reinforce our understanding of a graph like this. So for example, the graph below represents the motion of a car that moves along a straight road. So this one says, if I were to give this to you as a student, I would say describe the car's motion. So you would look at this graph and try to write down maybe a few sentences at most uh, explaining what exactly is happening in this graph. So there's a lot of different routes you can take here, a lot of ways to explain it in your own words. Um, what I'm going to say is maybe the origin point, so notice we're not starting at the origin point, we're starting 10 kilometers, kilometers are the units used here, away from the origin. So let's pretend you are the person in the car, and let's say the origin is home. So maybe you are at work right now, 10 kilometers away from home. Okay, so this is kind of my visual I'm going to use to set this up. So home is at zero, you're 10 kilometers away from it. So that's the first point of information we can use uh, to describe this motion. We start at time zero, 10 kilometers away from home. Now, 10 kilometers on its own doesn't tell you exactly where you're located because just saying I'm 10 kilometers away from a point could mean you are 10 kilometers anywhere in a circle around the origin point. So the value here is positive. And so that indicates we are to the right of home. So we're to the right of the origin. So we start moving then. Notice that the value of our position decreases. So we're going from 10 down to 9, 8, 7, 6, all the way down to 0. We get to home, our origin point, and then keep going past it. So here along this entire first segment of motion for the first uh, 30 minutes, for the first 30 minutes we're traveling in a negative direction, in other words, to the left. We're passing home and maybe uh, 20 kilometers away from home is the store. We wanna run and pick something up. And so we drive to the store 20 kilometers away from home in the other direction. 
the car is parked, let's say, for 10 minutes while we're inside, uh, grabbing an item, um, and then getting back to our vehicle. And then we drive back to the right, all the way to the origin, back home. So we start 10 kilometers to the right of home, we leave work, we drive past home and go to the store, we stay at the store for 10 minutes, get back in the car, and then we end up back at home. So you can look at this in a very detailed lens. So um, this graphic here tells you each um, part of the motion. Um, in general though, we can summarize this, let's say in like two or three sentences. So we could say as follows. The car travels to the left for 30 minutes, and then to the right for 40 minutes. Nonetheless, it ends up left of where it started. This means the car was traveling faster when it was moving to the left than when it was moving to the right. Now, we will learn about how speed can be determined here. Um, right now, this is a graph of position versus time. There's nothing explicitly stating how fast you're moving. But as a hint, it has to deal with slope. But we won't hint at that just yet, uh, or we won't do more than just hint at that for now. So right now, you might be a little bit confused, I understand, because this can be confusing. This whole discussion using graphs is one of the toughest, um, I guess, topics that I cover in my courses. So practice this. Review these graphs over and over. Try to understand exactly what you're looking at and piece it together like we see here on the right. So with this said, let's add a little bit more detail and depth to this discussion. We represented position, now let's represent velocity. Recall, uh, with some basic definitions, velocity is a vector, meaning that it has both a magnitude, in other words how fast, and a direction, uh, to the right or to the left, let's say. Speed, on the other hand, is only the magnitude of velocity. In other words, it only tells you how fast. It does not give you a direction, and so it's always positive as a result. For example, uh, for us in the United States, the speed signs along the highways. Uh, you might see 70 miles per hour or 60 miles per hour, or maybe 35 in a more residential area. You never have a negative speed. That doesn't make any sense. So, um, recall again, this is all just rehashing from material previously. Velocity, then, is defined by displacement over a time interval. So, delta x over delta t. But notice I put two equations here, because we're starting to hint at the fact that not all motion is horizontal. So, we use x, x values for the horizontal motion and y values whenever we have vertical motion. The equations are the same though, they're still displacements over time intervals, still displacement over a time interval. All that matters is whether it's horizontal or vertical, whether or not you're choosing x or y. But the reason we're bringing all this up is to say the following. In the x direction, the horizontal direction, if you're moving to the right, it is positive. And if you're moving to the left, it is negative. Okay, so it doesn't matter where you're located, even if you're, say, located to the right of the origin, your position is positive, but if you're moving to the left, you're moving with a negative velocity. And in the vertical direction, the y direction, moving upward is positive, moving downward is negative. So, let's put all of this together now and see how we can jump from a position graph like we just made with that student's motion to discern velocity. So just as uh, the motion of the student walking to class had three different phases, so um, looking at this, so in the beginning they were walking at a steady pace, that's the first phase, in the second phase they slowed down to talk with a friend, and in the third phase they sped up, uh, perhaps jogging to class because they were running late. Well, they have three different phases, and if you look at the graph that we made of her motion, we'll notice there's three different slopes as a result of that. Again, slope meaning how steep your line is. So, look at this. So, we have a moderate speed in the middle, and we have a moderate slope. 
The student then slows down, and you have a shallow slope. Then the student runs or jogs to class, and you have a steep slope. So we're seeing that there has to be some kind of connection between how fast you're moving and how steep your slope is on your position versus time graph. So how do we prove that that's the case? Well, remember, by definition, slope is rise over run. Okay, so slope is rise over run. We'll look at our, uh, look at our graph. Our vertical values, what we're rising by, is our position, x. So, rising is our displacement. Running horizontally is time. So, we're changing time. In other words, it's a time interval. So, we have slope equal to a change in position over a change in time. Well, look back at our last slide. A change in position over a change in time, by definition, is velocity. So if slope is change in position over change in time, and velocity is change in position over change in time, well, that must mean slope of a position versus time graph is the velocity of that motion. So we can put that into words again. The slope of an object's position versus time graph is the object's velocity at that point. So the slower you move, the shallower your slope. The faster you move, the steeper your slope. It is a direct relationship between these two things. So this is extremely important, and it's something uh, we will practice uh, in just a, a few minutes. So, let's just review before, again, moving on to the final slides of this lecture. Let's just kind of recap and discuss everything we can discern from a position versus time graph. So, from a position versus time graph, if you wanted to know the object's position at some time t, you literally just read the graph. So, for example, looking back, uh, let's say at th I wanted to know the student's position at 3 minutes. Well, at 3 minutes, the position was 200. Or was it, I think it was 180. I think 180 at 3 minutes. So if I want to know the position from a position versus time graph, you literally just read the graph. So again, at three minutes, the student was at 180 uh, meters. So that one's the most e obvious. You just literally read the graph. But we just learned about this next point. You can determine the object's velocity at some time by finding the slope of the graph at that point. And we saw the correlation that a steeper slope would indicate a faster speed, and vice versa. To add to this second point, we can also determine the direction of motion. Not only how fast they're moving, but what direction they're moving as well. Positive slopes, so a line that points upward to the right, corresponds to a positive velocity. In other words, an object that's moving to the right if it's horizontal motion, or upward if it's vertical. A negative slope, in other words, a line that is pointing down and to the right, well then that would correspond to a negative velocity, in other words, motion that is to the left if it's horizontal, or downward if it's vertical. So, let's put all this together with an example that we can work out together. In fact, we're kind of going to do two, um, but the first one I'm going to go quickly, and then the second one I'll do in full detail. So let's again revisit that student's position versus time graph. And what we're going to do is determine her velocity at each segment. Up until this point, we don't know how fast the student was moving throughout her motion, but we can figure it out. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to write it out in full for segment one, um, but then I'm just going to kind of quickly uh, do the next segments just for the sake of time. So recall that slope by definition, is rise over run. And again, we're rising by our position, so this would be a change in position. And our run, or the horizontal value, is time, so delta t. So what we're doing is we're looking for the change in position for segment 1. So they started at 0 position, 
and ended at 180. So remember, delta x, or displacement, is final minus initial. So we have 180 meters minus the initial, which was 0 meters. All divided by how long it took to do this, well, it goes from 0 to 3 minutes, so we have 3 minutes. So we have 180 meters over 3 minutes, so that would be 60 meters per minute, right? But that's not really common units. Let's put this to meters per second. I'm not going to show the conversion for this um, for the sake of time again and space. But we know that there are 60 seconds for every minute. So this is just 1.0 meters per second for segment one. So in the beginning, when the student was walking at a steady pace, they were moving at one meter per second. Well, let's do this again. So slope equals rise over run which is delta x over delta t. So for segment two, we are going from 180 meters to uh, 240 meters. So we have 240 meters minus 180 meters, all divided by, again, a three minute time interval. All right, so in the second phase, we're going from 180 to 240. So we have, uh, let's see, another uh, 60 over 3 this time. Uh, so that's 20 meters per minute. And so again, if we do a quick conversion, we divide by 60 to put this into meters per second. Um, and so this should be 0.33 meters per second. This makes sense. The student has slowed down to talk to a friend, so we see a slower uh, velocity as a result. And the last segment where the student is moving the fastest, in this last segment the student goes from 240 to 540 meters, so we have 540 minus 240 all divided by three minutes. And I apologize if my handwriting is a little sloppy. It's still hard to look at the screen while writing with my hand down here, so I'm not looking at my hand while I write, which is a little bit awkward. Also, I just think I have bad handwriting. But uh, anyway, so we have 300 meters over three minutes, which is 100 meters per minute. So divide by 60 to put this into meters per second, and we get 1.67, or with a little bit of rounding, 1.7 meters per second. Okay, um, I th I'm going to pull up an image which might block part of my answers here, but here we have our three velocities. We saw that, or we said before we even did this calculation, that they're moving at a pretty steady speed, then they slow down, and then they get really fast toward the end. Well, here's the proof. Steady speed slows down, and then picks up speed at the end. We now have the full information about this student's velocity over time, which means we can now take these numbers and make a new type of graph. We can make a velocity versus time graph now. And so we can do exactly that here. We know for the first three minutes, the student is traveling at one meter per second. Then for the next three minutes, the student is traveling at 0.33 meters per second. And then in the last three minutes, the student is traveling at 1.7 meters per second. And so we have just created a new graph based on the information from the original. All we did was find the slopes of each line, and now we have all new information about how fast the student is moving, and we can put that into a new type of graph. So, I think, personally, again, probably a nerdy bias here, this is really beautiful. We can create new graphs just from old ones to present new additional information uh, with context to the problem. But, again, it's a sharp learning curve for students. And one of the biggest issues is the fact that we have all these position graphs and all these velocity graphs, and in our next lecture we'll have acceleration graphs too.
So there's going to be three different graphs. All of them have different meanings and you have to switch between them. So from position to velocity and backwards. And the point is it can become a little bit overwhelming to say the least. So that's why I'm kind of breaking this up into multiple lectures. And I'm going to try to give you lots of examples and questions at the end to practice these. So with that said, um, let's go ahead and move on to a second example of this because it is so important um, to kind of get an understanding of this before we move on. I want to do one more example, even though it's going to take some time to write out. We have a new graph now. This isn't the student walking to class anymore. This one just says without any detailed information, it's the graph of a car moving along a straight line. So this problem says draw the car's velocity versus time graph. Well, to be able to draw a velocity versus time graph, we need to know the velocity. And so much like last time, our goal here is to break this into the three segments that we see. The first segment down into the right, second segment horizontal, third segment moving up. So we got to break this into three segments, find each of those three velocities, and then we can make that graph. So this is going to be a very similar process uh, to what we saw in the last example. So let's jump right into this. Uh, again, uh, we'll call this, uh, let me use a different color so you can actually see it. So let's oops, call this segments one, two, and three. So we'll say this is segment one, this is segment two, and this big guy is segment three. So for segment one, that is not a straight one. Uh, for segment one, same process, slope, which is velocity is equal to, let's say, delta x over delta t. So in the first segment, remember, it's final minus initial. The car's final position is negative 4. Okay, negative 4. So final, negative 4, minus the initial, which was 0. Note the negative sign certainly matters here. And it's part of the reason why I wanted to do this example because I wanted to show you what happens with some negatives. Uh, the time it took was from zero to two minutes. So this is a two minute interval. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, excuse me. This is labeled in seconds. If you look on, on the right of our graph, it says time in seconds. So this is, we won't have to worry about the minutes to seconds conversion. So we have two seconds on the bottom. So negative four divided by two is negative two meters per second. So that's the velocity of the first phase of motion. Well, let's look at the second. We have slope equals velocity equals delta x over delta t. So in this case, uh, final minus initial. Well, the final uh, position is negative four meters minus the initial, which is also negative four. All divided by uh, two seconds again. So here, notice it's a horizontal line. Well, that's indicating that our position isn't changing at all. So theoretically, without even looking at the numbers, if we have a horizontal line here, we're not moving at all, which means we shouldn't have a velocity, which means our math here should give us zero which it does because we have negative four minus negative four. You get a double negative, so it's negative four plus four, which is zero. Zero meters per second, which again makes sense because our position is not changing. And for the last segment, slope equals velocity, which is delta x over delta t, we have a final position of, I th well, I think six. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, we have six. Okay, let's go with that. I might be doing this wrong. Let's double check. So six meters uh, minus the initial, which was, okay, we're good. Negative four meters per second. All right, so all the way at the top right, we're at six meters. We started, though, at negative four. And again, this takes two seconds. 6 minus negative 4 is the same as 6 plus 4, so that's 10 divided by 2, 
which is 5 meters per second. We now have the three velocities for this vehicle's motion, so we can construct our velocity versus time graph. We should have a velocity of negative 2 for the first two seconds, 0 for the middle two seconds, and 5 for the last two seconds. In other words, our graph should look like this. Negative 2 for the first two seconds, 0 for the next two seconds, and then 5 for the final two seconds. So part B says to describe the motion in words. We can just say the car backs up for two seconds at two meters per second. It sits at rest for those two seconds, or for two additional seconds, before it then drives forward at five meters per second for two more seconds. Okay, so this is kind of just a way to visualize it with math and then put it into a graph and then explain it with words. So this is three ways to describe the same thing, mathematically, visually with a graph, and with words. So hopefully these, this dual uh, combination of examples helps you a little bit um, to paint the picture of working from position to velocity. Now to conclude today, before we go into some questions, we can also work backwards. We're only gonna give a brief hint at how this works and in our next lecture, we're going to go into a lot more specific detail. So we have gone now from position to making a velocity graph. Well, what if we're presented with a velocity graph and we want to work backwards? So let's set up an example. Suppose you leave a lecture hall and begin walking toward your next class, which is down the hall to the east. You then realize that you left your textbook at your seat in the classroom. You turn around and run back to the lecture hall to retrieve it. A velocity versus time graph for this motion is given. So you're walking away at one meter per second. You realize you forget your book. You turn around and run back uh, at a higher speed. Notice it's negative because you're running backwards to the left. So there are two clear phases of motion here, right? Walking away from the lecture hall at one meter per second and running back at negative three meters per second. So our question for now is, how do we go backwards? How do we deduce our position versus time graph from this information? Well, the sign of your velocity graph tells you whether the slope of your position graph is positive or negative. And the magnitude of the velocity, in other words, how big the velocity is, tells you how steep your line is going to be. As before, we can analyze the graph segment by segment. For the first segment, the velocity graph indicates motion with a constant velocity of one meter per second, and it's positive. This tells us that our position graph must be a straight line with a positive slope of one meter every single second. So, if we move at one meter for every second, for 15 seconds, that means we should end up at 15 meters after 15 seconds. Well, for the second segment, where the velocity is negative 3 meters per second, we should have a negative slope, and it should be steeper because the value is bigger. And so here we see us running back to the origin point. So steeper slope, we're running back now, back to the lecture hall to get our book. The position graph here makes sense. It shows 15 seconds of slowly increasing your position as you walk away from the lecture hall, and then five seconds of rapidly decreasing position as you run back, and you end up where you started. Now, that is a little bit vague. I mean, it's not very specific on how to exactly make those graphs. So again, we will introduce that in our next video. Before that, let's go through a few questions. So again, I'll read the question. I'll be quiet for a few seconds. I recommend you pausing the video to think about your answer before you let me say the answer. So question one, which position versus time graph below matches the motion diagram of a car moving along a straight road as shown? Okay. 
So here we have a bunch of position versus time graphs. We have to figure out which one makes sense for this motion diagram given at the top. First thing to notice, the origin point, the location of it is very important here. The origin is right here. So all the dots on the left hand side are at a negative position. They're to the left of the origin, so these are negative values. So the first segment of our graph should be negative, in other words, below the time axis. So that rules out A and D, because those don't have a negative position, so values below the time axis. Notice that B, C, and E do all have negatives to start with. Okay, now we just have to determine what to do about the slopes. All of our options here show the second segment with a positive slope. So we can't deduce it just based on whether or not the slope is positive or negative. But notice what happens. In the beginning, we're moving pretty slowly. So we should have a shallower slope. But then once we cross the origin, we start moving faster. So we should have a steeper slope. So our graph should have a shallower slope and then a steeper slope. So that rules out B, because that shows a steep slope and then a shallow slope. It rules out C, which has a constant slope, and leaves us with our answer, which is E. We start out with a negative position, because we're to the left of the origin, and we're moving pretty slowly, so it's not a very steep line. But once we get to the origin, we start moving faster, and so we get a steeper line as a result. The answer is E. All right, next question. Same situation, but this time it wants you to uh, pick the appropriate velocity graph. So same motion diagram as before, but now choose a velocity graph. All right, so let's have a look here. In the beginning, um, so there's a, basically two segments again, so the segment before the origin and the segment after. In the beginning, we are moving, right? We're moving in the beginning, so that immediately rules out D, because D is showing zero velocity in the beginning. So just by definition, right away, because we know we're moving, that rules out D. D doesn't make any sense there. Now, notice that the spacing between each of these dots in the beginning is equal, indicating that we are moving at the same velocity the entire time here. So our velocity is not changing, which rules out A and B. A and B both show your velocity increasing and your velocity increasing, but it's staying the same. And then once we hit this new phase, we're suddenly moving at a faster speed. And so the answer here is C. We're moving at a slow velocity initially, it's the same value, and then once we hit the origin, we're suddenly moving at a faster velocity, which isn't changing because the spacing between those dots is the same as well. So that option does make sense, so because of that, none of the above is not an answer either, because C is the correct response. Okay, well, but wait, there's more. Let's do another one. This time we have a different motion diagram, but it's the same concept of a problem. Use the new motion diagram now to choose the appropriate velocity versus time graph. All right, so this one tends to be trickier for students and for a good reason. We have to deal with negatives and negatives tend to confuse students. First of all, notice these all look generally the same. All these graphs have the same kind of S-like shape. So we do recognize that there are two different segments of motion again. So here on the right of this red line I've made, we're moving at a slower speed, and to the left we're moving at a faster speed. The very first thing to note, and this is important, all of the motion is to the left. 
we're moving to the left, which means we are moving with a negative velocity throughout the entire motion. That rules out A, that rules out C, and that rules out E. Our values should always be negative in velocity because we are always moving to the left. Be careful. If this was asking for position graphs, it would all be positive because we are always to the right of the origin. But this is velocity. If you're moving leftward, it is negative. So we have to choose between B and D now. So all we have to do is figure out, do we start with a bigger velocity and then move to a smaller velocity? Or do we start with a smaller velocity and then end up moving faster? So notice we're starting on the right hand side, we're moving pretty slow, and then we get faster. So that is D for the answer. You start out slow in the negative direction and then get faster. So bigger velocity here. All right, so let's do two more. A graph of position versus time for a basketball player moving down the court appears as follows. Which of the following velocity graphs matches this position graph? So this is a little bit different. We're not using a motion diagram now. We're using a position graph to go to a velocity graph. So take a moment to see what you might think it would be. Okay. Again, we have two segments. I'm going to split it by a red line. So segment one and segment two, let's say. So for segment one, the left-hand side of the red line that I've made, notice it's a horizontal line in position, meaning our position is not changing the entire time you're in segment one. So if we're not changing our position, we are not moving. So our velocity should be zero. That rules out A, because we have some velocity there. All options B, C, and D show a zero velocity in the beginning. So, so far, any of those three could work. Now, we have to realize what happens in segment two. Well, in segment two, we're moving downward. In other words, uh, our position is decreasing. Our position is decreasing, meaning it has a negative slope here. So as a result, we should have a negative velocity. That rules out D, which shows a positive velocity. All right, so we have a negative uh, slope in our position graph, which means we need to have a negative velocity. The only thing left to do is to figure out, is our velocity changing here, or is it the same value? Well, because this is just one single slope, I can't draw a straight line apparently, because we have one single slope here, the velocity is constant. It's a constant slope, so it's a constant velocity. We are not changing velocity, which means our answer must be C. We start out by not moving, so velocity is zero, and then we're suddenly moving with a negative velocity. The answer is C. Last one, let's work backwards. A graph of velocity versus time for a hockey puck shot into a goal appears as follows. Which of the following position graphs matches this velocity graph? All right, so let's break it in to, you guessed it, two segments of motion. In the first segment, we have a constant positive velocity. It's constant, meaning just a horizontal line. So we're moving at the same velocity for this whole segment, and it's positive. So a positive velocity means a positive slope. We need a positive slope in the first segment. This has a zero slope for A, and C has a zero slope. We need a positive slope because, again, remember that connection. Slope is velocity. So velocity, if it's positive, means we need a positive or increasing slope. 
Okay? So both B and D show that. We then have to figure out which option between B and D works based on segment two. In the seg second segment, we suddenly stop moving because the velocity drops to zero. So we build up our position, we build up our position, and then we stay there. We stop in place once we get there. D is the correct option. We're moving with some velocity, increasing our position, then we stop and we stay there. Note that B is a big no, because what it's showing is technically teleportation. Because your position, based on this graph, is instantly changing. Right? So if look at this. So we have some position here, and then we suddenly drop to a zero position. So this was this would indicate technically teleporting, which uh, we have not figured out yet. So um, this is not even a realistic example, regardless of what you were given in the beginning. So the answer is D. All right, so that is it for this lecture. In our next lecture, we're going to build on this even further and eventually start including a third type of graph for acceleration. But we haven't even defined acceleration yet, and so that's what the purpose of our next lecture is. We'll introduce uniform motion and acceleration. As always, thanks for watching, and have a great day.